London, home to over 8 million people. When someone gets seriously hurt, it's down to the trauma doctors to investigate. She's hit the headlights. I think it's probably going to be with the right side of her pelvis. To save lives, they must look for clues. The helmet is damaged. That worries us about the impact to the head. The trauma doctors have to assess the evidence within minutes. So there's a dent here, but as to which bit of him hit that, it's not entirely clear, but quite possibly his head. And unravel the medical mysteries. There are a myriad of things that can cause all of those symptoms. That police was asking me if this is still life-threatening, which it is. In their search for answers, getting it right can mean the difference between life or death. <laughs> 24 hours a day, the doctors of London's air ambulance respond to life-threatening emergencies in and around the M25. Either in the air ambulance or the rapid response trauma cars. Navigating the streets of North London is trauma doctor Gareth Greer and paramedic Steve Barber. Red base out of the 770 ETA, 10 minutes over. They've just received a call to a serious incident, a man who's fallen from a building. So we're going to someone who's fallen three storeys uh, with a head injury, that's all we know at the moment. Looks like the ambulance is on scene already, so we'll meet up with them and see what we can do to help. With falls from height, there is a high risk of spinal fractures, internal bleeds and head injuries. Gareth will be looking for clues that could point to any of these. 23-year-old John was working on a chimney when he fell 30 feet off a ladder. Hi, guys. You OK? Hello. How, how are you doing? All right, I'm Gareth. This is Hello, Steve. Hello, Steve. You all right? Yeah. In a bit of an awkward place. Uh, yeah. Come from the top, yeah. apparently. If he's come from the top of that, then that could be quite serious. Can't see anything that would have broken his fall on the way down. It looks like he's come to a sudden stop, so it's quite a big impact. How are you doing? All right. Hello, John. Yeah. I'll bring him to the top of his face there. John? Yeah. I haven't probably been out to set him. Okay. He's complaining of pain in his lower back, centrally, yeah. okay. down mainly on the left side into his left leg. Just to let you know, his yeah. blood pressure's a little bit low now. Yeah. 98 over 70, okay. yeah? All right. His pulse is 100. No problem. Okay. Uh, he's quite pale as well. Yeah. John, um, just to say hello, my name's Gareth. I'm one of the doctors, OK? We're going to help you with your pain as well now, all right? OK, we're going to get you nice and warm. The guys are doing a great job. His blood pressure is relatively low. He's also very pale. I am really worried that he's bleeding from somewhere. We're going to help you, all right? The first thing we need to do is get you out of this little confined area, OK? And then we can help you lots and lots then. It's likely John has damaged his spine in the fall. Manoeuvring him out of the awkward space is risky. But if they're to save John's life, it's a risk they have to take. Do we need some painkillers before we move? I think we do. The main bit to support is going to be his middle bit. So. Lift him out onto the scoop stretcher. Yep. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll try, if we can, yeah. try and get him up, try and get him at least halfway on the scoop if we can. Okay. Yeah? Once we're up, once we shuffle around, right. yeah? Okay. So on three, on to yeah. one, two, three. Stay with us, mate. Okay. Okay. Is everyone okay? Mm -hmm. Don't worry. Yeah? Man. Okay. Should, guys, should we go straight into the ambulance? The sedative is starting to affect John's memory. I don't know what's going on. John, John well done. Okay. And you feel a bit frightened because the painkillers are very strong as well, OK? I don't know what's happening. John, yeah. fall off the lever. Yeah. So what we'll do is go in, cut clothes off, have another look. I think it's just going to be painkillers splinting the pelvis and, and running down to the London. Help me. Well done. Help me. I, 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 Good, man. What is me? 
Johnny down well. This is just a drug. Blood pressure 150 over 96. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's what the doctor gives you. Okay. You're nice and safe. Hopefully you're warming up. Have you still got any pain anywhere, John? He could have landed directly on his back and broken his back. I'm also concerned about all of the bones between his feet and his back. They're all vulnerable here, including the pelvic bone, which could also be fractured. And with pelvic bone fractures, you sometimes get some bleeding, which can be severe. So is everyone happy with the plan, guys? So collar and blocks, we'll keep him as analgesed as we can yeah. till we get down to the London. Yeah. I don't think we need to give him an anaesthetic at the moment, but we could change that plan if we need to. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can manage his pain, pelvic splint, off to the Royal London. John, this is going to feel a bit weird, but we're just going to have these around your head to stop you moving whilst we're travelling. Yeah, we're good. We're good to go. Thanks, guys. You're perfect. John's injuries are potentially life-threatening. They need to get him to the specialist trauma team of the Royal London Hospital as quickly as possible. The elite squad of trauma doctors from London's Air Ambulance deal with the capital's most serious emergencies. Years of training have turned them into medical investigators. They look for the clues and search for evidence that can lead them to the right diagnosis and save patients' lives. The latest patient being rushed into the Royal London Hospital is 23-year-old John. He's fallen off a ladder and has potentially life-threatening injuries. We've got um, a HEMS patient that's been brought in who's a 20-year-old male who's been fallen about 30 feet um, and has had a hypotensive period, so worried about blood loss. Um, and they suspect pelvic injury, which would certainly be a, a common cause of major blood loss. You OK? Happy? Patient's arriving, so if you just make some space for to come in on this side, please. So everybody, this is a gentleman in his 20s called John. He was at the top of a, a three-storey building on a ladder when he fell from the top to the bottom, landed on his back. When we got there, GCS 15, but complaining of a lot of lumbar back pain, looking very pale. Um, so from the top down, he's, he's got a head injury with a laceration to the left frontal region. He's um, fully ketamine, ketaminized at the moment. He's had 150 milligrams of ketamine for pain in his back. Hence his GCS at the moment is about four, but okay. I think his natural GCS is 14 or yeah. 13. Lots of back pain and posterior pelvic pain. He was moving his legs normally on scene. And with a summary, is four thirty feet with back injury and head injury. All right, Thank you. lovely, thanks. Are um, so you happy with the airway at the moment? Yeah. Okay, and then Luli, if you can carry on with the primary survey, please. He's fallen from three floors onto the ground, and some people don't survive that. He's already had a low blood pressure recorded, and that makes me concerned that he is bleeding. He's also likely to have spinal fractures. I know he's got a head injury. That could easily progress and become a big problem also. Hello there, can you open up your eyes for me? Hello, you're just in the resource room. Okay. Hello, John, Hi there, John. Can you squeeze my fingers, John? That's it, fantastic. Bilateral transmitted upper airway, sounds equal air entry bilaterally. No bruising over the chest that I can see. Sats of 99, good volume central pulse. Weak volume peripheral pulse, refused to the hands. John is certainly at risk of having a pelvic fracture. And the trouble with a pelvic fracture, with all the blood vessels that run over the pelvis, is that internal bleeding associated with that is very likely and difficult to detect. Okay, so if we can get um, another line in, some blood off and um, pelvis x-ray. And... So the chest x-ray looks pretty normal. Uh, there's really no sign of any bleeding or any uh, injury to the lungs or the chest wall, which is consistent with the clinical examination. There wasn't really any sign of that. Um, it was 
below the waist really that was more concerned about. So let's have a look at his pelvis x-ray. So the pelvis is asymmetrical, so it's wider here on the left than it is on the right. It also can be because the pelvis has been disrupted and is not uh, intact in its ring-like shape, which it should be. Um, and then the second abnormality is that the, uh, there's a lucency running through the pubic symphysis here, which is a fracture. Um, although it doesn't look like a major fracture, the fact that there is a fracture there makes me worry that the pelvis itself is more disrupted than we can see. OK, we're good to go to CT, I think. It's not just John's pelvis Simon is concerned about. He needs to find out if John has damaged his spine. If he has, there is a danger he could be paralysed. Slide, on slide, ready, brace, slide. Oh, what's going on? What we're going to do is get a little x-ray of your neck now to check oh. it's OK. Really? What is going on? What's going on is you're in hospital because you had a fall, OK, and they gave you a drug to make you sleepy because you were in quite a bit of pain to start with, all right? Seriously, I John. have no idea. I know, I know. That's what the drug does. Can you... Can you... Why am I... Ah! John, John. Oh, I tried to stop my ankles. John. I can't remember yesterday. What happened? No, that's, that's part of the effect of the drug that you're given. I'm panicking. I know. It's all right. You're fine. It's OK. This is all proportion. OK. They need clear CT images of John's spine and pelvis, but with the sedative wearing off, it's proving impossible. Can I bring him out for a minute? Help me. John, you're fine. I'm just going to bring you... Don't panic. All right, listen, John. Yeah? Hello. My name's Simon, I'm one of the doctors. Do you remember me from earlier on? Hi. OK, well, I'm one of the doctors who's looking after you. It's important you keep nice and still for the scan, just for a few minutes, and then we'll get you out of here, OK? Why, why am I here? Just because you had an accident, you had a fall, and you fell quite a height, so we wanted to have a look at the x-rays and scans of you and see if there's anything broken. Just keep nice and still for a minute. Right. Despite our best attempts to reassure him, it's going to be very difficult for him to keep still whilst he has the rest of this scan done. So, um, really, I haven't got any other alternative than to give him some more sedation so that he's uh, able to lie still for the scan at least. Thank you. Emma Styles. Just keep. Emma. Okay, so we're going to get hold of Emma for you, okay? Oh. I'm crossing my fingers and toes, hoping that he doesn't move. Two and a half thousand images so far. <laughs> it might take a little while to look at them all. Simon can now see the full extent of the damage to John's pelvis. As is often the case, the, the fracture is much more visibly extensive on the CT than it was apparent on the X-ray. So he's got actually quite a um, quite a significant pelvic fracture with some bleeding and a clot of blood that's formed around the fracture, and actually. You can see that the bleeding is still continuing at the time of the CT scan, so, which explains why his blood pressure was um, a bit on the low side. John's back in recess, and the effects of the drugs have finally worn off. I'm, I'm a bit uncomfortable. My lower back hurts quite a lot. But I mean, I'm OK. They've, they've dosed me up. Yeah. <laughs> it's a morphine. <laughs> I remember being up on the ladder and being kind of dragged off but then after that I don't I don't remember falling no I didn't know what was going on I had no idea what had happened I had to be told what had happened and then even now the memories are still extremely vague I'm, what I told you earlier is what I think happened but I can't be for sure because it just happened so fast so. Simon's now got the scans of John's spine He's got a fracture of his um, lumbar spine. The uh, cause of his pain, uh, five, four, three, two. So his second lumbar vertebrae, lumbar vertebral body is uh, being compressed. Uh, and has lost a bit of its normal height. And in fact, to one side, it's, mm, it's potentially unstable. So the main thing now is his spinal cord was working because his legs, grossly anyway, his legs are moving. 
Um, he's not being uh, made paraplegic by any spiral, spinal cord injuries. So we need to preserve the function of his spinal cord and not to let anything happen that could cause any injury to his spinal cord. John's admitted to the trauma ward so he can be monitored. Only time will tell whether or not the damage to his spine is life-changing. London's air ambulance has been called out to an emergency in south-east London. Trauma doctor Anne Weaver is on the case. Uh, car vote for pedestrian, elderly male, was unconscious, now combative. Okay, An elderly man has been knocked down by a skip lorry and the team need to get there fast. Elderly people involved in traffic accidents are more likely to sustain injuries. They often have fragile bones and are on medication that can make them bleed a lot. In these circumstances, head injuries can be fatal. The air ambulance has permission to land all over Greater London. Right, is this road, I think. Sometimes it's not quite close enough. Mate, we've just been sent to an accident at the end of this road. Can you give us a lift? Is that all right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's straight down the road to the roundabout. It just means we will be in a better state when we get there. Yeah, especially me. Thank you so much. Your star. Cheers. Come in, guys. Hello, Hello, how are you? Are you all right? Yeah. Oh, no. This is Peter. Peter's elderly gentleman. He's crossing the road just here. Uh, Skip Laurie's just going past. We think it's clicked him in his head. This accident happened about 30 minutes ago now. 88-year-old Peter was on his way to the post office when the truck hit him. Do you know what's happened? Oh, no. You've been hit by a lorry. Oh, no. We're going to help you, OK? No. What's your name? Oh. What's your name, darling? No. He's clearly agitated. He's not answering questions appropriately. I'm worried that he has got a bleed inside his brain. If his blood pressure is high, it can make a bleed in the brain worse. No. Anne no. needs to sedate Peter. No. Little scratch. No. Okay. No. No. So, guys, if someone can hold his other no. hand, do you mind coming yeah. back? Thank you. Just no. hold that hand. No, he's right on there. Thank no. you. Brilliant. No. Okay. Mommy, mommy. Good stuff. All done. Mommy. Keep calm, Peter. Oh, I can't Stay still, Have you Peter. had a blood pressure, guys? Oh, no, no really we've been one. moving around too much. No. We've had a few attempts at it. So he's going to go a little uh, bit relaxed uh, in a minute. Uh, no, 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 Peter, stay still, stay Lovely. still, stay still. Right, guys, have you got a dressing uh, handy? Uh, Two seconds. Yeah. OK, yeah, I've got him now, that's right. Yeah. How are you doing? We're going to lie you down, sweetheart. Well, OK, let's get us his clothes out. Have we got a blanket to cover the rest of him? I think from an agitation point of view, um, we have to worry that he's got a decent head injury, don't yeah. we? He but, has um, blood coming through his nose as well. So yeah. It's... OK, let's have a little look at his pupils. OK, they're equal. Hemorrhage there, all right. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like he's got a tooth missing, but I don't know if that's a new he's one. He's got though. a wound around here somewhere. Yeah, OK. That's new, yeah. OK, he's got lots of blood around his teeth. So the, okay. the, the, the skip lorry's hit his head to fall to the floor or if he's hit his head after it? OK. I think in view of the fact he was agitated and that we couldn't manage him without the midazolam, I think we should probably put him off to sleep and then take him to an MTC as far as his head's concerned. You all happy with that as a plan? Yeah. OK. Oh. All right, my love. Oh. All right. Oh. It's OK. Oh. Red Bay Medi Medic One, this is going to be an RSI and carry back to Royal London. Big bag. Big bag. Right, back to 100, heart rate 93. Giving Peter an anaesthetic is a risk. I could make things worse by lowering his blood pressure or dropping his oxygen levels, but I am worried about him having a brain injury. I think this is the best course of action. Okay, there's loads of blood. Okay, but I can see. Let's put the 
collar on, and then if we drive round, because when we get to the aircraft, but in the morning we'll do a quick I and R check. Yeah. Yes, thanks. With Peter now intubated and stabilised, the ambulance takes them back to the helicopter. There is a risk doing this to people who are older, but actually this is in his best interest at the moment that we're able to control these things for him and get a good quick CT scan, and if necessary, he might need neurosurgery. The nearest hospital is 25 minutes away by road. Peter may have a bleed on the brain which could kill him. Anne needs to get him to the Royal London Hospital for emergency care as quickly as possible. Roll. We really want to bump him if we can help it. Yeah. Well done. Just to let you know, we're bringing you a patient by air. He's an elderly man who's a bit of a pedestrian who's been hit by a skip lorry. Um, he was he had reduced GCS and was particularly agitated. He's had an RSI. Um, he appears to have sort of limb injuries, but predominantly head injury. Um, we'll be with you in about 15 minutes. The journey to the Royal London Hospital will take just seven minutes by air. Every second is critical if they're to save Peter's life. At the Royal London, the trauma doctors deal with everything from life and death injuries on the road to medical mysteries in the hospital. We're going to go and see a young lady who's come in with quite a sort of sudden dramatic onset of dizziness. Hi. I'm Simon Walsh, I'm a consultant in A&E. So what actually happened to you today? Um, I was there driving and just all of a sudden started feeling dizzy. Um, I had to go to Sainsbury's, so I managed to park in Sainsbury's. Um, and I managed to get downstairs into the actual supermarket and then I just felt really dizzy and lightheaded. When you say you felt dizzy, just tell me exactly what, what you were seeing and feeling at that time. It just felt like everything was moving around, that, you know, like if you come off of a merry-go-round when you're little. There must be 30 or 40 different causes of dizziness. The most serious of those include things like brain tumours, um, bleeding within the brain, so it's quite tricky to know which way we're going with this. So what I'd like to do is just examine you, Let's have a look in your eyes. With so many possible causes for Annette's dizziness, Simon needs to find some clues fast. I'm going to ask you to put your hands out in front of you to hold them steady. Take my hand, squeeze my fingers tight, and go back and forth as quick as you can. I'm going to move my finger to make it a bit more difficult as well. Yeah. OK, so you're a little bit unsteady there. A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. OK. Just the reflex on the right knee jerk is just slightly reduced compared to the left side. Tell me if you see double at all. There is, there are some just some subtle um, abnormal movements of your eyes when we do that. Well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's like when you stop, all of a sudden, it, I almost feel as if I, my eyes want to continue moving. Right, yeah. There is some slightly abnormal movement of her eyes. These could be caused by an abnormality of the middle ear or with part of the brain that deals with balance and coordination. Have you got any family history of dizziness? My mum had problems with her eyes and she mm -hmm. had to have a, um, a brain scan because they thought that there was problems with the nerves there and then it came about that she had a large aneurysm there, okay. which has been successfully coiled. Okay. Whilst my mum was waiting for the operation, yeah. her older sister actually had a stroke and she they found out that she had an aneurysm that actually burst. Um, another sister actually found out that she had um, an aneurysm. Because of the, the history that you've got in the family, uh, I think it's probably worth doing a CT scan. OK, I'll see you in a little bit. Yeah. So, we've got a couple of abnormal findings which don't particularly fit together in my mind to give me an answer, but there's enough to make me think I need to go looking a bit further for uh, anything potentially serious. When my mum found out she had the aneurysm, it was a complete shock to the whole family because Essentially, you know, we, when she found out that how big it was, she was told basically she's a ticking time bomb. If you've got an aneurysm there, then it's best to know about it uh, before it causes you any problems. At that stage, you can prevent someone who might potentially go on to have um, a catastrophic uh, bleed inside their brain and um, cause them long-term disability or even death. 
With such a strong family history of aneurysms, Simon decides to take Annette for a CT scan. If she does have one and it's ruptured, it would explain her symptoms. There's nothing that sort of is leaping out as, um, as obviously abnormal, um, which is good. So I certainly can't see any signs of any bleeding around the brain or within the brain that shouldn't be, that um, would obviously be abnormal. So it's answered some questions in that there isn't any sign of any bleeding or any, any tumour, but it doesn't actually tell us if there is an aneurysm there or not, which is another question that I have. So your CT scan, I mean, I had a look at it and it does, it looks normal. Okay. So that's obviously reassuring. Yeah. Um, I think with your family history, we want to be absolutely certain there isn't anything, um, uh, any sort of aneurysm sitting there to cause problems in the future. Simon still doesn't have an answer. The next step is to get a far more detailed MRA scan and see if that reveals anything. We're going to a patient who is very cardiac arrest. Shock. Yep, straight for shock. OK, all clear? Wow! Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh... An elite team of trauma doctors cover the 607 square miles of Greater London. Either by land or air, they're on call, saving lives, 24 hours a day. Dr Anne Weaver is on her way back to the Royal London Hospital with Peter, an elderly man with a serious head injury. So we've got the helicopter coming with one of the pre care consultants, Dr Weaver with an elderly gentleman who's been hit by a skip lorry. I haven't got a full list of his injuries, but he's been intubated and ventilated, so he's probably pretty badly injured. The whole point of the helicopter is that patients should arrive stable. There's a process where the helicopter team can tell us if they're unstable, which is the code red process. And he specifically said this isn't a code red, which means she's been able to stabilize him on the scene, which means the next bit for us is to find out what his injuries are and if it's something that is time critical that we need to operate on. Malik needs to establish whether Peter has a bleed on the brain. If he does, it could be fatal. If he's stable, yeah. um, we're probably just going to go straight to CT. OK, this is Peter Brooks. We think he's in his 70s to 80s. At about quarter past 12, he was hit. He was a pedestrian hit by a skip lorry. Um, he was agitated with the London Ambulance Service, unable to tolerate oxygen or a collar. His injuries from top to toe, oh, he's got obvious head injury with um, wound on his right side of his cheek and some facial bruising. Chest is clear on examination, chest wall intact, abdomen soft and pelvis symmetrical. Um, and he had a full dose anaesthetic with fentanyl, ketamine and rocuronium. Um, so in summary, pedestrian hit by skip lorry, presumed head injury. Thank you much. If you just wait, let's get the scoop, we'll get the scoop out, then you do that. He's been hit by a skip lorry. That will have caused a massive energy transfer. He can have injuries to brain, spine, soft organs. I'm worried that he could have internal bleeding, significant injuries in a 28-year-old, let alone an 88-year-old. Can we do a primary survey whilst we get the scoop out? Yeah, you've got it. Obvious injury to the anterior chest wall. Yeah. Pupils are two millimetres. So I want to see a number of his blood pressure, and then we're going to leave. What's the last blood pressure you had? Um, good, we've had good blood pressure. The systolic was 200 pre-RSI, and we've had high ones, yeah. OK, fine, yeah. fine. The pre-hospital team has stabilised him, so he's got a good blood pressure, he's got a normal heart rate, there's no signs of internal bleeding. So the priority is working out if there is an operation that's needed, particularly in his head. So he's been here seven minutes, we're just going to CT now. We're going to go to CT with what we've got. Bring a cannon with you, because we can scan his head with just the one vein flop. Yeah. So let's just go. All the clues point to a serious bleed on the brain. There's no time for other x-rays. They need to get Peter to CT now to find out exactly what's happening. No. Daughter's coming, is she? Yes, she's with her. The hospitals managed to contact Peter's two daughters. He's normally a fit, healthy, independent 88-year-old who still runs his own business and looks after his wife. I hope the scan doesn't show an intracranial hemorrhage. 
If he's got anything that will need him to be ventilated for a long period of time, he's aged 88, he's likely to have a very difficult time. Mm. So if you look at his scan, there are two bits to it. There's an area here of contusion and subarachnoid bleeding, um, which will cause some brain swelling in the future over the next 12 to 24 hours. And if you were to rescan him in 24 hours, this would look significantly worse. But then there's also something called subdural. There's a very thin rim of blood that's sort of going up across his brain underneath his skull on the right-hand side. And the, the question is whether that's going to carry on bleeding or whether it's going to stop. If it carries on bleeding, it can cause pressure inside the brain. It's, it's really difficult because if you're 28 and that gets bigger, you take it out. If you're 70 and that gets bigger, you take it out. 75, 80, 85, at some point the operation itself will kill you. And at what point we reach that isn't completely clear. But at 88, probably he wouldn't survive a neurosocial operation. Peter's injuries are so serious, the accident may well become a criminal investigation. So the police are always interested in the level or the severity of injury of the patient because it determines their response on scene, so it determines what type of investigation they do. So they use a phrase, life-threatening, life-changing, to determine what response they put into a, a scene. So that police was asking me if this is still life-threatening, which it is. An elderly gentleman who's had a bad accident, it's very difficult at this stage to predict how he's going to do. Peter was a flight engineer in Bomber Command during the Second World War. Only time will tell whether Peter will survive this battle. In a medical emergency, speed of response can make the difference between life and death. London's air ambulance can be scrambled in a matter of minutes. And when the helicopter can't fly, they hit the road in a rapid response car. The service also runs a physician response unit, or PRU, which gets doctors out to patients to provide on-the-spot treatment. Today, consultant Glenn Ryan is in the PRU. We're going to King's Cross Station for a patient who is, is query cardiac arrest. I, I don't have any more at this stage. When someone is in cardiac arrest, every second is vital. The longer it is before the patient gets treatment, the greater the chance they will die. Is there anyone that knows exactly where this patient is? And if there is, can someone take us to it, please? Excuse me, guys, please. Sorry. You all right? After you, mate. All right, guys, anybody doesn't need to be in here, we need to actually hop out. We need to create a bit of space in here, guys. Thanks, sorry. 74-year-old Warner was in cardiac arrest. The paramedics have got his heart going, but his pulse is very weak and his heart could stop again at any time. So how long has this been going for now, Lee? Before I got in, he'd already given one shot. 15 minutes, brilliant. So he's had five, six shocks in total. Well done with the access, he's got a grey over there. Your pulse is becoming weaker. He's gone, he's just gone. Is he in VF? Yeah, we'll shock him again. Warner's heart is failing again. We really need to get uh, this patient out of ventricular fibrillation. He's critically ill. He's at risk of having significant brain damage from lack of flow to the brain. Yep, straight for shock. Okay, all clear? Yep. Okay, shocking. Shock delivered. Lovely. Excellent. Come now. All right. Yeah, no worries. Let's get him on the auto pulse. Secure the LMA. I'm going to get the AICD. After seven shocks, Warner's heart still isn't beating properly. Glenn's hoping an auto pulse, a device designed to give precise chest compressions, will help. All right, shock again, please. Okay, shock it. Shock delivered. Okay. Has he got a pulse? I just want somebody to keep his fingers on pulse. Do you want a cardiovert? Cardiovert him, please. Sink cardiovert. Yeah. Just assisting his veins. Oh. Oh. Stand clear, Stand guys. Clear. Ready? Yep. Wow. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Oh. It's all right. Oh. Okay. He seemed to feel that, which is in some ways a good thing. 
he's localising the pain. So we're in a lot better situation than we were five, ten minutes ago. Okay, it's like radial this. pulse back. Radial pulse back, is it? Yeah, it's got femoral. He's got a femoral pulse. So plan from here, Lee. Yeah. Same again. Onto the stretcher. Good work, guys. That's the way. Oh. Okay. So we need that. That just needs to go on a little bit more. Oh. I'm going to lift him up. Warner's heart is now beating more regularly. They're giving him cold fluid to reduce the risk of brain damage. I've spoken to the London chest. We need to blue call it in on the way, but the patient's going to the cath lab. So let's get him to the ambulance. But Warner is still in a critical condition. They need to get him to the specialist heart hospital fast. I've got one ECG. Long and short of it is, he's a, I don't know any details. He's a 60 plus year old gentleman who presented to one of the guards unwell, vomiting, and then arrested in front of him. Glenn and the team have done all they can for Warner. It's now up to the specialist cardiac team at the London Chest Hospital. The next 24 hours will be crucial. Just all of a sudden started feeling dizzy. Squeeze my fingers tight. My mum, she had a large aneurysm there. Okay. With your family history, we want to be absolutely certain there isn't any sort of aneurysm sitting there. The CT scan of Annette's brain is normal, which leaves Simon without a diagnosis. He needs to do more tests. What experience has taught me is that, um, unfortunately, things don't always fall into place as you hope they might do to give you an answer when you examine someone. Um, and particularly with um, people who present with neurological problems. Today, Annette's back at the hospital for further investigation. This thing is just to relax and try and hold really still. I see my job mainly is ruling out, most of the time, serious diseases and serious illnesses. But occasionally, you find someone with something really serious and, and potentially something which we could prevent someone from coming to harm. Annette is having an MRA scan. It will show up the blood vessels in her brain and reveal whether she does have a potentially life-threatening aneurysm. OK, Anis, I want you to keep really still. It's about 10 minutes long. It's estimated up to 8,000 people die from a ruptured brain aneurysm each year in the UK. If an aneurysm is the cause of Annette's dizzy spell, then discovering it now might well save her life. That's you done. You're going to come out now. The results are in. So these are really amazingly detailed pictures um, which are showing uh, there's a network of blood vessels that are supplying the brain. I'm looking for any sort of abnormal swellings or outpouchings of these vessels, particularly around the base of the brain here where they're quite common. That was the major concern with such a strong family history. Um, that it was caused by an aneurysm that was waiting there to pop, but there's no sign of that, so it's great. We're pretty much then left with the less serious stuff, which is um, things like viruses, which can affect the middle ear, or uh, even sort of bits of grit that get um, stuck in the, um, the uh, balance organs that help me tell you which way up you are. Um, so, and those things can cause very severe symptoms, but they're not going to endanger a life. Three direct members of a family have had uh, cerebral aneurysms, so I'm sure she'd be very relieved to find that she hasn't got an aneurysm waiting to pop there. We're going to a patient who is very cardiac arrest. Straight for shock. Okay. Okay. Ah! Warner spent 10 days in hospital. He was fitted with a device which will kickstart his heart if it goes out of rhythm again. He was really sick and he had such a long time of CPR before he got there, but his CPR was really, really good quality, which you know obviously gave him a better chance. But I must admit, if I really, really 
think about it, I'm really quite surprised at how well he's done and I'm really, really pleased. I think the team should be really happy with that. Warner was repatriated to his home in France, where he's making a good recovery. He recently celebrated his 75th birthday. Fallen three stories. 23 year old John has fallen off a ladder. Got a fracture of his spine. So we need not to let anything happen that could cause any injury to his spinal cord. John, John. That was 11 weeks ago. I don't remember it happening. I don't, you know, one minute I was up at the top of a ladder and then the next minute I'm in hospital. It's my dad. He had, um, he fell off a roof as well. So he was cleaning out the gutters on my old house and uh, he fell, he only fell two stories. It wasn't as impressive as me. So. <laughs> Knowing, you know, finding out that I had, you know, injured my spine, you automatically, I, well, I automatically link that to being, you know, I'm going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. And then finding out that I had injured my wrist, you know, being a guitarist of so many years, I, you know, I use it every day, basically. And not knowing if I'm going to be able to do what I love to do, you know, being a musician. It was, yeah, it was quite, it was horrifying. Now I feel like it's been given back to me. So I'm gonna grab it and basically do everything I can to make it a reality for me. You've been hit by a lorry. Uh, oh no. We have to worry that he's got a decent head injury, don't we? He's an elderly man who's a bit of pedestrian who's been hit by a skip lorry. He'll be with you in about 15 minutes. It's three weeks since the accident. Although Peter is still in hospital, he has made a remarkable recovery. We thought you had a bleed, you know, we thought you had a serious yeah. brain injury, so getting you to the hospital and the surgeon. I don't know what was possible. wrong with me because I, I've no memory of it whatsoever. I feel a bit scatterbrained. Although you didn't need to have an operation on your head, your brain has still been shaken a little bit and it takes time for that to, yeah, for your brain I hope to recover. It will settle down. But you're much better than you were even when I saw you a few weeks ago. You, really? Yeah, you do really well. You well, do amazingly. I'm, well, I was completely upside down when I got here. Yeah. I'm an independent person or have been. Well, Dad's main carer for my mum, um, so that's been very yes. difficult. Well, the first thing when he saw my mum, he went, sorry, darling, I'm sorry I'm not at home to look after you. Oh. <laughs> and she gave her a wink. I know you won't remember that. You've got to get yourself well somehow to justify the trouble that's been spent on you when it comes <laughs> down to it, isn't it? Yes. I had a black arm. All the way up here. Well, I didn't do that. No, nor did I. <laughs> <laughs> well, you take care. Thank you. Nice to see you both. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. 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 My name's Annie, I'm one of the doctors. Are you in pain at the minute? Yeah. Where does it hurt? Your head. A big swelling on the right side of his head. Great work. I am quite worried about him. Amy London. This is an unknown middle-aged male. The patient's got a head injury. We're not quite sure what's happened yet. Check the pupils. Nasty eye injury. There's bleeding inside the skull. And that pressure can squash the nerve that supplies the eyeball. And this white here, which is bleeding, is significant. You have got bad bones. Yay. Very well done. We've got it in. Flare cam, and I went to the ground. No! Gentle, gentle, gentle. Can go into multi-organ failure from burns. Yeah.